It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, David E. Campbell. Uh, David is a uh, is professor at Notre Dame University, where he is the John Cardinal O'Hara Associate Professor of Political Science, and he is also the founding director of the Francis and Kathleen Rooney Center for the Study of American Democracy. Um, David Campbell is a specialist in religion, public policy, and civic life. His most recent book. American Grace, which is this gigantic tome that the uh, discussants have, uh, is um, American Grace, How Religion Divides and Unites Us, is co-offered with uh, Robert D. Putnam. It, it is receiving wide attention for its penetrating exploration of the changing role of religion in American life. He earlier published Why We Vote, How Schools and Communities Shape Our Civic Life, which examines how communities foster civic norms and how civic norms adopted in adolescence can lead to a lifetime of civic engagement. He is also the editor of Matter of Faith, Religion, uh, Religion in the 2004 Presidential Election. And he has a, a new book that he's working on, uh, which I'm very excited about, um, called Seeking the Promised Land, Mormons and American Politics, which he's authoring with uh, Quinn Monson of BYU. So, uh, very excited to have him here. And without further ado, David Campbell. It's great to be here. We're having a little audio visual uh, uh, troubles here. So, while that gets worked out, why don't I uh, begin with the jokes at the beginning? Uh, it's nice to be here at the other university in Utah Valley, the one where I can buy a Coke. <laughs> Caffeine free. <laughs> That's right, that's right. <laughs> um, I just thought I would begin with a story that perhaps would resonate here in Utah Valley in a way that might not in other parts of the country, and you'll see why I say that as I, uh, as I tell the story. Um, I teach at the University of Notre Dame, which some of you might be aware is a Catholic university. So I spend my entire career being a fish out of water. I'm this Mormon guy, I teach at Catholic University, I teach American politics, and I'm a Canadian. I just never fit in. Uh, but a few weeks ago, we actually held an event in Notre Dame that is truly historic. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. And when I describe the people there, you will see why I wouldn't describe it as historic. We had a panel on the role of religion in a liberal democracy. And the panel sounds like a joke, like a bad joke. We had a rabbi on it, and David Saperstein. Uh, he's a prominent uh, member of the Reform uh, Judaism uh, world. Uh, we have Richard Sizen, who might be known to some as, as a prominent evangelical who's kind of falling out with uh, the religious right. We have Rick Warren of the Saddleback Megachurch. Um, we have um, a Catholic Archbishop, and we also have Elder Dowling Jokes of the LDS Church, all on one stage. And here's my story. I was privileged to spend uh, the day with Elder Oaks and his wife. My wife and I uh, took them around campus. Uh, if you've ever been to Notre Dame's campus, it's beautiful all year round, especially in the fall. And um, Notre Dame has a, a basilica, which I like to refer to as a super church, uh, that's right in the heart of campus. It's a beautiful building. You could say that it's the most Catholic place in America, uh, in that it's this uh, the church right there uh, at Notre Dame, they actually broadcast mass from the church every Sunday on, on uh, cable television. So there I am uh, with Elder Oaks and his wife and my wife, and we're, we're touring through the building. You can take tours and, and look at the various things they have on display. Um, are we, I think we're good. We're good. Yeah. Um, and I turned at one point to look over to you know, something on one side um, of the building, and I can see out of the corner of my eye that this couple a husband, what appeared to be a husband and wife and a baby, um, had stopped to talk with Elder Oaks. And I thought, well, this must be a couple from our area. There are multiple LDS wards in the South Bend area. I don't know everybody in the ward, so you know, it must be somebody I don't know. I went out afterward, after they finished chatting with him, and asked, did you know that Elder Oaks was going to be on campus today? And they said, no, in fact, we don't even live here. We're just visiting Notre Dame because they were looking at the business school at Notre Dame uh, for next year. So here they were in the most Catholic place in America, and who do they run into but Elder Dallin H. Oaks? Which I said to them is a story I'm sure they will tell for the rest of their lives. It would be a little bit like going to the Marriott Center and finding the Pope. But, <laughs> uh, 
Just before I dive into my remarks, I also wanted to hear, now I can speak to the microphone. Um, I also, is that, can you hear me on this? Under the B at 24. Oh, do we have any bingos? No, okay. Um, the mic is live. I'm also uh, grateful to be here uh, with someone I just wanted to take a moment and, and single out because uh, I was thrilled to see his name on the program, and that is Jay Bonner Ritchie, uh, who is here in the, in the front. I took a class from Professor Ritchie many years ago at BYU, um, and it left uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, an impression on me that I have never forgotten, and I've never had an opportunity to thank him for that. So here I am saying thank you, Bonner. Um, I know it sort of feels like it's a testimony meeting or something, but uh, <laughs> I shall carry on somehow. I want to talk today about this book that was uh, mentioned in the introduction, and thank you very much, Luke, for those uh, very kind words uh, in the introduction. Uh, the book is titled American Grace, How Religion Divides and Unites Us. And so what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is hit um, some of the highlights of this book. As you can see, it's a, it's a big book, so I'm not going to be able to cover everything in it. But I would like to talk about um, the central puzzle that Bob Putnam, my co-author, and I cover in the book um, that I think you'll see is relevant to our discussion today about uh, civil uh, dialogue across religious lines. In the book, we pose a question. We describe a puzzle about the United States. It's a puzzle that many Americans don't even realize is puzzling because it's the world they know. It's the only one they've ever seen. But I assure you, by historical standards and certainly by international standards, it's a puzzle. And the question is, how can America be three things simultaneously? How can America be a country that is religiously devout, religiously diverse, and also religiously tolerant? Now, I'm going to spend some time talking about all three of these points, but I'm going to bet that in this audience, like in most audiences that I address, um, the idea that America is a religiously devout country and that we are a religiously diverse country, those are probably not terribly controversial claims. The third claim, that we are a religiously tolerant nation, sometimes I meet with a little resistance on that point. So I'll spend a little bit more time trying to make my case and then, really what I want you to walk away from today is what I hope to be an answer, or at least a partial answer, for how it is that America combines these three things. It's truly quite remarkable, because typically when you combine religious devotion and religious diversity, you don't get religious tolerance. Instead, you get mayhem and violence. So think Baghdad and Belfast and you know, various places um, around the world today, and perhaps even in America's own history. Um, within our own borders. But that's not the state of play today. All right, so let me begin uh, just quickly to make the point that America is a religiously devout country. Lots of different ways that I could make that argument. I will just briefly show you this one slide. And if you can't see the slide, that's okay. I'm going to describe it to you. Or if you're a person who hates charts and graphs, just close your eyes and you can listen to the words. Um, what you're looking at is a graph that compares the rate of weekly religious service attendance at a variety of countries around the world. Now, this is not the only indicator of how religious a society might be, and we can debate back and forth over whether this is the right measure. It's one measure, it's a common measure, and it makes my point. So if I could just um, stick with it for a few moments. Um, you can see that the United States is the red bar, and the way I've arrayed the data, it looks like the United States falls right in the middle. You might say, well, what's this guy from Notre Dame telling us that America is a religiously devout country? It looks like America is about average. And I suppose by some standards that's true. But perhaps the most relevant comparison for the United States is actually not all the countries on this chart, but rather the countries that I've highlighted in uh, that kind of goldish color. These are countries including Italy, Canada, Britain, Germany, France, Japan, Sweden. I could put many others that are also advanced industrialized economies um, on that list. And you would find that the United States has a higher rate of church attendance and really any measure of religiosity than any of those other advanced industrialized countries. In fact, in a factoid that I love to point out, if you look just below the United States, you will see the nation of Iran. The United States, at least by this one measure, 
is actually a little more religious than the nation of Iran. That's a pretty amazing thing to note when we talk about religion in America. But of course, the other characteristic of religion in America is not just that this is a religiously devout country, but also that this is a religiously diverse country. What you're looking at behind me is the um, percentage of the American population who fall into different religious traditions. A religious tradition, a religious family. So in some cases, that's a single denomination like the Catholics or the Latter-day Saints. But in other cases, especially in Protestantism, a tradition is a collection of different denominations. For example, the evangelical Protestants. Not a single denomination, but a cluster of them, and sometimes even non-denominational churches. And as you can see, the single largest religious tradition in America today are the evangelical Protestants, followed by the Roman Catholics, followed by an absolutely fascinating group, and one that is extremely relevant to our discussion today, a group that Bob Putnam and I like to call the nuns. Now, I do come from Notre Dame, so I need to make sure that everyone's clear on what I mean by a nun. I don't mean an N-U-N kind of nun. So we're not talking, you know, Maria and the Sound of Music or anything. This is someone who, when asked, what is your religion, will answer, mm, well, none. I don't have one. So it's an N-O-N-E kind of nun. And right now, in American society, roughly 18% of all Americans say they have no religion. That is a stunning change in the religious landscape of America. Only 20 to 25 years ago, it would have been no more than 5 or 6 percent of the American population who would have said they have no religion. And what makes this transformation perhaps even more stunning is that that growth in the nuns is almost entirely concentrated among young people, people under, say, 30 or 35, and it has all happened in the last 20 to 25 years. And I'll talk a little today about how that's happened and what it means. Uh, rounding out our list, we have the mainline Protestants. This is the more liberal wing of Protestantism. It's interesting to note there are today more people in America who say they have no religion than actually identify with the main line of Protestantism, the closest thing we've had to establishment religion in America. Uh, rounding out our list, we have the black Protestants. We think of the black Protestants as being a separate religious tradition uh, from uh, the other aspects of Protestantism uh, be, as a legacy of racial segregation uh, going back centuries. Um, we have a catch-all category, other faiths. That's where groups like the Sikhs and the Muslims and the Hindus and the Buddhists, all very important groups and certainly worthy of study. But because in our data, each of them represents a relatively small slice of the American population. We're not really able to say much using our methods about them systematically. Um, and then the last two groups are the Jews and the Mormons. And it often comes as a surprise to audiences that there are as many Jews in America as there are Mormons. Although sometimes people prefer that I say that there are as many Mormons in America as there are Jews. And either way, both the Mormons and the Jews are shocked to hear that. So you can take that home as something interesting to bring up um, in conversation. All right, so America is a religiously devout country. America is a religiously diverse country. No one of these groups comes anywhere close to capturing a majority of the population. But what about this claim that America is a religiously tolerant country? Well, lots of different ways we could tap into that. I'm going to show you a few here today. What you're looking at is a chart that comes from a survey a big nationally representative scientific survey that Bob Putnam and I commissioned a few years ago. We call it the Faith Matters Survey. It consisted of interviews with over 3,000 Americans, again, randomly selected through scientific methods, in which we asked them every imaginable thing about their religious life, about their religious beliefs, about their families, about their work life, about their civic involvement. It was a long interview, and we learned a lot about these people. And we not only interviewed them once, we actually interviewed them two more times. And you'll see as I go on in my remarks today why the fact that we interviewed the same people more than once turned out to be rather critical in our understanding of the dynamics of American religion. But for now, let me focus on this one question that we asked in our big, long survey. The question that went like this. Do you believe that a good person, not of your faith, can still go to heaven? And you can see that no matter the religious tradition we focus on, overwhelming percentages of Americans, 
whatever their religious background, say yes. People not of my faith can still go to heaven. It's 98% of the Mormons. I'll admit this is a complicated question for Mormons for reasons that I'm sure are appreciated within the audience, and I'd be happy to talk about those in the Q&A. Um, but if you look at the Catholics, it's 93%. If you look even at the evangelical Protestants, the one group in America you think might be pretty particular about who goes to heaven, 83% of evangelical Protestants say, yes, actually, good people, not of my faith, can go to heaven. Now, I can tell that this is a skeptical bunch. I was warned about UVU, and here I am, in the lion's den. And so I know that some of you are sitting there and asking yourselves the following question. Hey, but doesn't this just mean that the Presbyterians think the Methodists can go to heaven, or that the Lutherans think the Episcopalians can go to heaven? And maybe that tells us something about America, but that's not quite the same as, say, a Catholic who believes a Jew can go to heaven or an evangelical who thinks a Mormon can go to heaven. Um, just throwing it out there. Um, so, Bob Putnam and I, we share your skepticism, and we actually asked a follow-up question, in which we specified, for those who come from a Christian background, what if that good person we just described, what if they're not Christian? Do you still think they can go to heaven? And the numbers still come out to be very high. 98% of Mormons, 83% of Catholics, and 54% of Evangelical Protestants. Yes, the number's gone down, but it still means that over half of all the Evangelical Protestants in America today believe that you do not have to be Christian to go to heaven. I've spoken to a lot of audiences, and I can assure you that number does not sit well with many Evangelicals, but there it is, or at least with Evangelical clergy and uh, theologians. Now, I'm going to return to this theme of religious tolerance in a few minutes because I want to talk about the ways that religion unites America. But I would be remiss if I did not also talk about the ways that religion can divide Americans because the fact of the matter is religion can, and it does, especially in our politics. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And to do so, I actually want to do a little audience participation thing. I'd like you to think for a moment, in your own personal experience, how often you say grace or give a blessing over a meal. So different faiths use a slightly different terminology to describe essentially the same thing. But how many people here, and I actually want to see a show of hands, how many of you would say that you say grace or give a blessing over your meals daily? Okay. Take a look around. And how many of you are willing to admit in this crowd that you never say grace? We've got a few. I have asked that question of different audiences around the country, and you get fascinating uh, differences when you, uh, when you speak in different parts of the country. I spoke once at uh, Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. You can think of Calvin as being sort of the BYU of, of the Christian reform tradition. Um, in fact, much like BYU, everyone there is blonde. It's amazing. But there they are, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And uh, it's a, so it's an evangelical school. Um, religion is sort of in the air there. And I asked that question. It was so funny to watch the audience. You know, most everybody put their hands up. And then a few looked around and said, oh, me too, me too. <laughs> and then I asked the same question at Sarah Lawrence College outside of New York. Now, if you don't know anything about Sarah Lawrence, it's kind of the opposite of Calvin College or the opposite of... Uh, of BYU. It's a, pretty, it's a pretty secular place. And I asked that question, and there, um, you know, most people kept their hands down. A few put their hands up, and as they looked around, quickly pulled them back down again. So you get different uh, answers to that question. And if you ask the population as a whole, you get what you see behind me, which is that almost half of Americans say that they give a blessing to God or say grace over their meals every day. And roughly half of America reports that they never or only occasionally say grace. And there's a small number in between. There are very few things that I could ask the American population that would divide them so cleanly into two nearly equal halves. One example would be, and I want you to think about this for a second, carrying a purse. Because only women are there talking. Okay. And some of you are thinking, well, wait a second, carrying a purse, that's interesting. W what, what about the 10% in the middle there? And I say, well, those are all those guys that carry those man purses around. That's what, sorry, anyway. 
Okay, so we have this division in America between roughly half of the population who say grace and half don't. Now that in and of itself is sort of whimsical and it's the sort of thing USA Today might put on the front page of their paper. Um, but does that really have any meaning? Well, it turns out that that one question, that one question, how frequently do you say grace, predicts an awful lot about people. If I know how often you say grace, I can, with pretty good accuracy, predict how you vote and which party you prefer. Now, I can't do it, of course, with absolute certainty, and there are lots of exceptions, but in general, I'm assuming this will not come as a sh shock uh, to anyone living in the contemporary United States, that we have a divide, a religious divide, between our political parties. And it's not that there's some sort of causal thing going on, you say grace, that makes you a Republican, but rather something has happened in our politics whereby those folks who are more religious are more likely to gravitate to the religious right, if you will. They are more likely to gravitate to the Republican Party, and those who are less religious are more likely to gravitate to the Democratic Party. And it's not just true of you know, Gray saying, it's sort of any measure we might come up with of how religious somebody is. Now, to some people in the audience, the younger folks here, that just seems like the natural order of things. Well, isn't that the way it's always been? But I assure you that historically, we are in an anomalous period. That while religion has always been a factor in American politics, it has not always had the same partisan cast that it does today. So if I could, I'd like to take just a few minutes and talk a little bit about the history of religion in just the last 50 or 60 years in the United States that I think can help us understand how we got to a point where we see what is sometimes described as the God gap in our American uh, politics. The Gallup poll has, for many years, going back to the 1950s, asked a question that turns out to be a pretty good seismometer, if you will, of what's happening to religion in American society. So periodically they ask large, uh, randomly drawn samples of Americans, do you think the influence of religion on American life is increasing or is it decreasing? And this slide behind me shows you the percentage of people who answer that question increasing. The role of religion in American society is on the upswing. Back in the 1950s, as you can see, almost 70% of Americans looked around them in American society and said, wow, religion seems to be on the upswing. And it turns out that by kind of any other indicator you could come up with, they were right. Church building was at an all-time high. Church attendance was at an all-time high. Church publications were being released and sold in record numbers. Sort of any way that you could think of religion permeating American society, it was at a high point in the 1950s. Some historians argue that the 1950s were actually the most religious period in all of American history. And so if I were giving this talk, I'd say in 1959, it would have appeared as though America was this highly religious country and that was the way it was going to stay. But then we went through a period known as the 60s. And as you can see, the percentage of Americans who said that religion's influence in society was increasing plummeted during the period of the 1960s. And what happened in the 1960s? Well, what didn't happen in the 1960s is maybe the better question. This was a period in which America went through this huge social change, including in religion. And closely tied to that change in religion, people sort of backing away from religion, was a change in the sexual mores in American society. In just a four-year period, which I assure you, to those, who study, those of us who study public opinion, is a blink of an eye. In just a four-year period, we saw the percentage of Americans who approved of premarital sex double. It went from 25% to 50%. And that's just one of many important changes. And as I said, tied to that was this turn away from religion. And so if I were giving this talk in 1969, it would have appeared as though America now was on this inevitable slide toward ever greater secularism. It's as though America was on its way to becoming France. But that's not what happened. Because 
religion is a dynamic force. And so following that shock of the 1960s, as we describe it in American Grace, came the first aftershock. It began in the 1970s, it continued through the 1980s and maybe even through the 1990s, but it has now ceased. This aftershock consisted of the growth in a conservative, a theologically conservative brand of religion, largely but not entirely concentrated among evangelical Protestants. And I could show you some other data on that, but I thought it would be enough for me to just sort of make that claim um, that over this period we saw, no, I don't want to overstate this, not dramatic growth, but we did see growth in the percentage of Americans who affiliate with and associate themselves with evangelical Protestantism. And that was happening at the same time that the other wing of Protestantism, the mainline folks, that they were hemorrhaging members. And so, again, if you look at the slide behind me, you'll see that through this period, Americans looked around them and said, well, actually religion sort of seems to be back in business, or at least we're seeing evidence of an increasing role of religion in American society, including, but not limited to, our politics. Because this was also the period in which we saw the emergence of the political movement we now regularly refer to as the religious right. And many people think that this has continued, that we've seen this ever and ever growing uh, number of evangelical Protestants in America, such that if I were giving this talk, say, in 1989, maybe even in 1999, it would have appeared as though America was on its way to becoming a majority Protestant and majority evangelical country. But of course, that's not what happened. Instead, we've had a second aftershock. The 60s were the shock. <coughs> that period of growth of evangelicalism and other conservatively uh, inclined faiths. That was the first aftershock. We are now in the period of the second aftershock. And it is in this period, over the last 20 years or so, that we've seen this rise of the nuns that I earlier mentioned. People who say they have no religion. And what it shows up as in our um, seismometer here is the percentage of Americans who say that religion's role is increasing, well, that's been on the downswing. In other words, more Americans are saying that religion seems to be retreating in American society. Now, just briefly, when I talk about the nuns, I want to be clear on what we mean by this group. To say that you do not have a religious affiliation today in America does not mean the same thing as describing yourself as an atheist. In fact, most people who say they have no religion actually also believe in God. And they are comfortable, certainly, with notions of spirituality and the idea of an afterlife. It's the label of an organized religion that they are most resistant to. It's important to keep that in mind because it does not appear as though these people are completely lost to religion. But their emergence is nonetheless a puzzle. What happened? Um, just to make the, the point quickly um, that this is concentrated among young people, uh, this graph shows you uh, the percentage of young Americans, so these are people under the age of 30, beginning in the 1970s, coming up to the present day. The percentage of these young folks who, if you look at the upper line, the orange one, um, who say they, are, they were evangelical Protestants, and you can see that that was a little kind of inclining, and then it began to decline, and then you can also see this sharp growth <laughs> beginning in the late 1980s, early 1990s, right in that period, of the percentage who say they have no religious preference. Whenever we see a sharp inflection point like this, it raises all sorts of questions for social scientists like myself. What explains this? What can't explain it is a slow-moving process of generational replacement whereby each generation of kids is a little less religious than their parents' generation. That may be happening as well. We see some evidence of that, and that's actually been the story of uh, secularism's rise for the most part in many European countries, but it can't explain this change because this change happened at one point in time. That process of generational replacement, that's a slow moving process. That's like a glacier and this is more like a thunderstorm or something that's happened all of a sudden. So we need to think about this. Well, what, what might have happened in American society that would have led to this 
change, this growth of the nuns? Well, here's a leading suspect for which we have a fair amount of evidence. What you're looking at is a graph that shows you the link between how religious someone is, in this case measured by how frequently they attend religious services, and whether or not they identify as a Republican. What the graph doesn't show, but I'll just mention briefly, is that we are simultaneously controlling for a whole bunch of other things about people that we know affect whether or not they prefer the Republicans or the Democrats. So we're accounting for gender and education and whether you live in the South and whether you're married and whether you have kids, okay? Just so we can isolate the impact of religious attendance. And the graph goes all the way back to the 1950s. And if you go back to the 1950s, we actually find that there was no relationship, no statistically discernible relationship between how frequently you attended religious services and whether you identified as a Republican. And that held steady more or less until well, we saw a little bit of an increase in the 1970s and then beginning in the late 1980s, early 1990s, we see a sharp and sudden increase in that connection between how frequently you attend religious services and whether or not you identify as a Republican. That change happens at exactly the same time as that growth of the nuns. That's our first piece of evidence that maybe, just maybe, that growth of the nuns has something to do with our political environment. A little more evidence. Um, over that same period of time, we've seen a growing objection to the political influence of religious leaders. Again, that change began in the early 1990s. It's continued uh, to the present. But even that, I will concede, is perhaps not the most convincing evidence of this argument. After all, lots of things were happening in the early 1990s that perhaps could be correlated with this change. So we've actually dug deeper. Remember I said when we did our big survey that we interviewed people more than once? So we're able to see what happens in people's lives as time passes? Well, what we find in a careful statistical analysis of our data is that increasingly it is people's politics that drives their religion, or more accurately, it is people's politics, if they fall in the center or the left of the political spectrum, that leads them to pull away from religion. Because this growth in the nuns is almost entirely concentrated among people who are either in the center or to the left of the political spectrum. We have increasing evidence that what's happening in the minds of many Americans, and especially young Americans, who have only known a world in which there is this tight connection between religiosity and politics, the period, the era of the God Gap. We have increasing evidence that what happens is that in these folks' minds, religion has become synonymous with not just politics, but a particular type of politics, a particular brand of politics, and it's not their politics. And so therefore, they pull away from identifying with a religion because to them, religion equals this Republican style of religion <laughs> or, or, or politics. How did that happen? Well, I thought I'd make a, uh, this point in a couple of different ways. Um, what you're looking at here is a picture taken at the 2004 Republican National Convention. That's George Pataki, former governor of New York, speaking at the podium there. This was in Madison Square Garden at the Republican Convention. Can you see on the podium that it kind of sort of looks like there's a cross there? Do you see that? Well, I was called by a reporter. This is one of the occupational hazards of being a political scientist, that you have to put up with calls from reporters. So I get this call from a reporter who was actually there at the convention. And he says to me, Professor, does it appear to you as though there is a cross on the podium? Because there had been this sort of backstage story um, circulating at the convention that the Republicans were subliminally embedding this cross on the podium to subtly send a signal that they were the party of religion. Well, I tried to make you know, the typical uh, point that, a, that an academic would, that really doesn't matter whether we think there's a cross on the podium or not. This is not a party that's been subtle about its use of religion, and we've seen the Democrats move away from religion, so that's really the story here. And the guy stopped. He said, no, 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 I just want to know, do you think it's a cross or not? 
I am at Notre Dame, so I guess that makes me an expert on crosses. Um, so <laughs> I said, well, because I re wasn't really sure where the reporter was going with the story, so I hedged my bet. And you can actually look this up. There's an Associated Press story that quotes me as saying the following. Well, it appears to have cross-like properties. <laughs> 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 but my general point stands um, that we live in a, in a world in which we see a lot of religious symbolism used in political appeals. This is a direct male flyer. It was used in the 2004 presidential election in the state of Ohio. You may recall that the 2004 election really came down to the state of Ohio. It was the quintessential battleground state that year. And in that year, Ohio, like 12 other states, had a ballot initiative on the question of same-sex marriage. And what we see here is an appeal made by um, the Republicans to folks in Ohio, reminding them that Republicans believe in America, but also using religious imagery. There's an image of a church. More directly, this is another flyer, also from Ohio, that concentrates, concentrates specifically on uh, the question of uh, marriage. And you can see, again, the image of a church, and you can see the family running through the field, and you're reminded that George W. Bush um, is fighting for your values. Now, you might say, well, okay, sure, in 2004 we saw a lot of this, but has that really held up? Is that really still the case? Um, let me show you some more recent examples. This is a campaign ad run by a woman named uh, Pamela Gorman in the state of Arizona. She running, was running as a Republican in the primary in her congressional district. And I want you to pay careful attention, not just to the images you're going to see, but to the narration, to the words you will hear. Did you all catch that? She's a conservative Christian and a pretty fair shot. All right. Well, you might say that's kind of unfair because one candidate in one congressional race. Um, here's a presidential race. Here's Rick Perry. Oh. No, I'm sorry. I have never had problems with this before. So I think the problem I is that while we were waiting, YouTube. Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, so I'm just going to start that again. And this should be the right end. Okay. And you might say, well, okay, that's Rick Perry, but, you know, he didn't win either. Now, where's the third one? I have another ad. All right, so I hope that makes the case that... Um, this is not language that is limited to uh, a few congressional candidates or a few fringe candidates. This is central uh, to our politics. And, you know, my, my point is not that, um, not, not to make an editorial comment actually on, you know, the, the merits of these arguments. It, it's simply to point out that this is what our political environment is today. And if I left the talk here, it would seem as though 
That's all religion does, is divide us. And in fact, if you just read the newspapers, it seems all we ever do in America is fight about religion. But in the last few minutes, moments of my address here, I actually want to emphasize that that message is wrong. That actually, even though we are undoubtedly divided by religion in our politics, religion unites Americans and does not only divide us. Remember, I earlier pointed out that America is a country that is religiously devout, religiously diverse, and religiously tolerant. I showed you a little bit of evidence on that point. Let me show you some more. On our big survey, we asked people, do you think that religious diversity has been a good thing for America? And what this graph shows you is how Americans who are very secular, that's the folks on this end, versus very religious, folks on the other end, the percentage who say that religious diversity has been a good thing. And across the board, overwhelming percentages say yes. Even of the most highly religious Americans, they say actually religious diversity has been a good thing. We also asked people, do you believe that there's very little truth in any religion? That one religion is true and the others are false? Or that there are basic truths in all religions? And the overwhelming percentage of Americans say that there are basic truths in other religions. Now maybe that's not religious tolerance, maybe that's theological squishiness or something, but whatever it is, it actually speaks well of our ability to get along because most Americans, most of the time, have high regard for those of most other religions. But that is not to say that we all feel equally about all religions. It turns out some religions are viewed a little more positively than others. We know this because on our big survey we ask people to evaluate their perception of other faiths. We did it using a thing that is kind of hokey, and it sounds like the sort of thing you might bring out in therapy. People like myself, social scientists, call it a feeling thermometer. Let's all sit around and pull out our feeling thermometers and talk about how we feel, but that's not what we have people do. Instead, we ask them to rate in this case, religious groups on a scale of 0 to 100. 0 means you feel pretty negative or pretty cold about a group. 100 means you feel really warm or really positive. 50 is in the middle. And you can pick any number in between. And you could do this, and others have, for not just religions. You could do it for political candidates. You could do it for brands of toothpaste. You could do it for Major League Baseball teams. But we did it for religions. And this figure, which is admittedly somewhat complex, tells a fascinating story about how Americans, using that indicator, perceive those of other faiths. So what you're looking at is how these different religions compare to one another, basically in this kind of a popularity contest, although remember, you don't have to make trade-offs, so you can think every religion is equally good or equally bad. Um, and we've arrayed the religions and how they're perceived by other Americans. And if you can see the figure, the circle, the size of the circle represents the size of that group in the American population. So you can see that some groups are big and some groups are small. Well, the most popular religion in America today. Ready? Drum roll, please. Envelope. The Jews. I've spoken to a lot of audiences, and I can assure you, no Jew believes it. But there it is. Um, right next to the Jews are the Catholics. And I'm not just saying that because of my employer. Um, and right next to the Catholics are the mainline Protestants. No surprise that the mainline Protestants are, are received positively. They are, after all, the main line. But... It is historically notable that Jews and Catholics rank very high because even though we didn't do feeling thermometers 50 years ago or 100 years ago, given the course of American history, I can assure you that's not where the Jews and Catholics would have ended up. We have a long history of anti-Semitism and anti-Catholicism in this country. I'm not suggesting that that's all gone, but I am saying that something significant has happened in American society that has led those once reviled groups now to be received quite warmly. And I should note that when we show these results, we've taken out members of that particular group from the analysis. So this is how non-Jews feel about Jews. It's how non-Catholics feel about Catholics. If you go down the graph, you can see that we have the evangelical Protestants and folks who are not religious. They're kind of in the middle. And then we have these three groups trailing at the bottom. The Mormons, the Buddhists, and the Muslims. And you can see that these groups seem to be the exception. They fall out of this sort of general story of religions being positively received. Now, you might be able to understand why Muslims are not perceived terribly well by many Americans. As sad as that is, perhaps it's not hard to understand. Um, 
in any other part of the country, I might say, and you might also find it easy to understand why Mormons are not so well received. Here in Orem, people are saying, what's wrong with the Mormons? I think they're great. Uh, but it turns out that in some quarters of the country, Mormons sometimes don't always get the most positive reception. But you'll notice that the other group clustered there are the Buddhists. Why the Buddhists? Well, we couldn't ask about every group, so we probably could have put Hindus or you know, others there and, and likely gotten the same result. Um, but we picked the Buddhists because we wanted to pick a faith that sort of by any measure would be considered innocuous. I mean, there are, as far as I know, no Buddhist terrorists or anything, but there they are. So it seems to be, our hunch was, something about the familiarity of these religions. Can't be the size of these faiths. Jews are small. Aunt Susan. I, I didn't see you writing that down. Your Aunt Susan. Who is your aunt? Thank you. Who is your Aunt Susan? Your Aunt Susan is that person in your family. Maybe she's in your neighborhood. Who is the kindest, sweetest, nicest person you know? She's the person who is always there to help a lending, with a lending hand. Uh, she is the one who brings the casseroles to the sick people. And you know that if there's a heaven, Aunt Susan is going there. She's destined for heaven. But you also know that Aunt Susan, she doesn't worship at the same altar that you do. She's of a different faith. And so theologically, you're supposed to believe that Aunt Susan is not going to heaven. Most Americans, when faced with a choice between Aunt Susan and their theology, they pick Aunt Susan. Now you might say, well, that's a nice story, Professor Campbell. Why don't we all just get together, hold hands, and sing Kumbaya? Um, but it turns out we have hard empirical data that this is actually what happens, that when people become close to those of other faiths, they become more accepting of those other faiths. This graph just shows you um, the percentage of Americans who say that they have either neighbors or close friends, not acquaintances, close friends or family members who are of another faith. And it turns out that almost all Americans have an Aunt Susan. And again, remember when I was describing our data and I said that we interview people more than once? Well, here's another case where we can see what happens when something changes in people's lives. Because we can tell you what happens when people become friends with someone of another faith, because we see it in our data. And what we find is as you become friends with someone of another faith, you become warmer, more, more uh, positive toward members of that faith. Now, that probably doesn't come as a surprise. Become friends with an evangelical Christian you begin to like evangelical Christians more. What is more interesting is that if you become friends with someone of another faith, that is, if your own personal social network becomes more religiously diverse, you become warmer not only toward those faiths within your friendship circle, you become warmer to other faiths that are not represented among your friends, and you also become more likely to say, that even those people who don't believe in God can still be a good American. To sort of boil that down, what it means is become friends with an evangelical, you become more positive toward evangelicals. Become friends with an evangelical, become warmer toward even the Mormons. So why is it that some groups are high on that chart, some are lower? Well, it turns out there are a lot of Catholic Aunt Susans in the world in America today. There are actually a lot of Jewish Aunt Susans, too. Um, even though Jews are a small group, they actually are the group most likely in American society to build bridges to those of other faiths. And those at the bottom of the list, including the Latter-day Saints, not so good at building bridges. Much better at bonding within rather than bridging out. And so that's just something to keep in mind um, at this moment as the Latter-day Saints go under scrutiny like they perhaps never have before. Um, this is a group that has suffered a bit because of the tendency to build inward rather than reach outward. And everything I've just described has been about friends and extended family members, but it turns out that another important piece to this story is the rise of religious intermarriage. This is a trend in American society that has gone largely unremarked upon. There was once a time in America where very few Americans married someone across religious lines. That's what this graph shows you. The orange line 
our spouses who start out in different religious traditions and stay in different religions. The blue line are those who start out in different traditions, but then um, one spouse changes to another, because that often happens, as I'm sure uh, people here can attest, uh, within a marriage. But either way, the growth of interfaith marriage in American society over the course of the 20th century and now into the 21st has been truly stunning, such that it's unremarkable. And if everything I said about your Aunt Susan was true, imagine how much more powerful the effect of having a spouse of another faith um, would be.